Welcome to Jerusalem Unplugged, the only podcast dedicated to Jerusalem, its history, and its people. Your host, Roberto Matza, will bring you guests discussing their relationship with the Holy City. A journey through history, society, feelings, and hopes for the future. Follow the podcast on all social media platforms at Jerusalem Unplugged. Welcome to Jerusalem Unplugged, the podcast dedicated to Jerusalem, its history, and its people. I'm your host, Roberto Mazza, and today it's with great pleasure that my guest is Andrew Lower. Andrew is the author of a number of books, but for the podcast, is the author of a recently published book by Doubleday, Under Jerusalem, The Buried History of the World's Most Contested City. Now, Andrew is also an author and uh, journalist for a number of uh, magazines and newspapers like the New York Times, the Washington Post, the National Geographic. But more importantly, in recent times, he published several articles that, were, that are available on his website, and I will post the link dedicated to digging uh, an archaeologist and archaeology in Jerusalem. And of course, we're going to talk about it with plenty of details. But first of all, Andrew, welcome. Thank you, Roberto. It's a great pleasure to be here on Jerusalem Unplugged. Andrew, you wrote uh, several books, three, in fact, one secret token about sort of mysteries in America and why did the chicken cross the world, which is a fascinating book, by the way. And, you know, a number of articles, obviously, for the Washington Post, the National Geographic, the Smithsonian, and so forth. But none of them really dealing with Jerusalem. So... How did you get to work on Jerusalem? Well, mainly I steered clear of Jerusalem. I mean, I've been writing about archaeology in the Middle East for more than two decades, and I, I just wanted to stay away from it. It seemed too political, too religious, too complicated. It was so much easier to write about a, a nice mound out in the middle of the Iraqi desert. Uh, and then, uh, which is one of those things, I was at a conference in Haifa uh, on I believe it was on uh, Crusader archaeology. And I was in touch with Israel Finkelstein, who I'm sure some of your listeners are aware of. He's a, a well-known Israeli archaeologist at Tel Aviv University. And he invited me to go to Jerusalem for uh, a little tour, have lunch, take a walk. So we did, but I never got lunch. Uh, and it was a, a lot of walking and it was a lot of walking underground. He took me underground, introduced me to uh, a lot of the... Uh, researchers who are working there. And in the middle of that, though, I, I remember a couple of excavators saying, saying, oh, you see that tunnel there? That was dug by a guy named Warren. And oh, here's Wilson's tunnel. I mentioned all these European names. I wonder what the heck, who were they? So I started to do a little digging on my own. And that's when I discovered this, this whole incredible history of, of archaeology in Jerusalem, which is not just uh, full of amazing characters, but also I found was really at the root of how Jerusalem became as contested as it is today. You're right. Uh, to steer away from Jerusalem is something that say, in my nearly 20 years uh, career of a scholar working on Jerusalem, sometimes I think about it, like maybe it would be a good time and it's a good time now to move away. But I, I, I think eventually I got uh, caught up into the history of the city different ways uh, as a scholar, as a podcaster, and uh, now it's very hard to actually do it. Uh, I was wondering how, how did you feel going around Jerusalem as someone who knows a lot about the archaeology and the history of the place, but as you said, you kind of like were not necessarily involved in the city. So you had uh, this missed lunch, but a lot of walk around the city. And that made me think about like, what did you see? How did you feel walking around Jerusalem? Well, I was floored to discover how much was happening underground. And obviously, most excavations that you see these days are above ground. You, you, there are people that are digging a trench uh, in some place that's easy to see, and you look down, and there it is. And in Jerusalem, there are a few of those digs, like the Gavati dig, which is just south of the, the, the Acrop city's Acropolis, that is kind of a traditional dig that just you go from the top and you dig down. But Jerusalem is unusual in its history because from the beginning, people were digging tunnels. 
and they're still digging tunnels today. So a lot of what is going on beneath the ground is simply not visible. And that's not only, uh, well, that's for a lot of reasons, uh, political, religious, and scientific all at once. Moving to, uh, to your book, uh, the book starts with a fascinating story, one that is largely neglected the name of uh, this French individual, who essentially, we may argue, was the first one to open the uh, uh, long season of excavations in Jerusalem, is Louis de Saussy. Louis de Saussy, in 1963, in a sort of a, a unofficial and certainly unsanctioned uh, way, uh, began excavating a specific area of Jerusalem. And then ever since, essentially, archaeologists never stop digging around the city. And I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about Louis de Saussy and what is the story behind him and, and essentially what is his legacy 200 years later? Well, his legacy is, is quite something. In fact, the controversy uh, around the place where he digs continues today in the form of a lawsuit uh, against both the Louvre and, and uh and the nation of France. But let me explain who he was. So de Zossi was uh, a, French, uh, a Frenchman who rose in the ranks and became a confidant of uh, Napoleon III, who at that point was the emperor of France. So we're talking in the 1860s. And he was really eager to go dig. Now, the Sultan who was in, in Istanbul uh, was the head of the Ottoman Empire, which included Jerusalem in those days. So when Dussozi wanted to dig, he asked the uh, emperor to use his uh, influence. And the Sultan in, in Istanbul was only too happy to say yes to a request from the French emperor, because this is a period when colonial powers in Europe are expanding. And the real prize of the 19th century was the Ottoman Empire itself. And the uh, Sultan was eager to get French help, both uh, military as well as financial help against the Russians who were pressing down, pressing down on the Ottoman Empire from the north. So from the beginning, the very first dig permit that was issued uh, in Jerusalem uh, by the Sultan was tinged with, not even tinged, it was heavily political. So Dzozzi shows up and he began to dig in what was called, in what's still called the Tomb of the Kings, which is the most magnificent tomb in Jerusalem. It's this underground tomb just outside of the old city. And now remember that archaeology really didn't exist in those days as a science. It really was people digging for treasure. Uh, people still didn't understand the way to understand the, the levels uh, to be able to uh, do the kind of analysis necessary to really peel back what's going on at particular times. This was a time when you wanted to get the cool stuff. And Dozozi was convinced that he had found a sarcophagus that had an ancient Judean queen inside of it. Now, of course, that turned out to be false. Actually, this queen, if she was indeed a queen, probably lived a thousand or two thousand years later. Uh, but that didn't stop Dozozi from hauling this off to the Louvre, where it became a sensation. It's the first piece of biblical history that you could touch. And meanwhile, in Jerusalem, the local Jews were furious that this tomb had been desecrated. They viewed it as a tomb of their ancestors. So from the beginning, you have this tension between the people in Jerusalem who lived there and these Europeans showing up wanting to find biblical history. And then this overlay of politics above of the Sultan in distant Istanbul allowing this Frenchman to do this uh, desecration, if you will. While the city of David, the so-called Givati parking lot excavation are certainly very popular, the Tombeau des Rois or the Tomb of the Kings is certainly less known, mostly because it's actually closed. Uh, so for those who have the possibility of going around Jerusalem, walking by Nablus Road or in East Jerusalem, you can see a sign, but really uh, it's been open only occasionally for a short period of time, but no one really has access to this uh, particular area. And I personally always found it fascinating and I always would try to climb a little bit just to see exactly what's on the other side. And I always found this story fascinating in a sense that it's really quintessential about the story of Jerusalem. As you said earlier, everything lies underneath the city of Jerusalem. And I was wondering after the Soussi excavation, how did archeology span develop 
uh, in Jerusalem, particularly in the period uh, under, you know, of the British rule, so after World War I. Yes, and, and just an asterisk there, um, the Tomb of the Kings has recently reopened. Uh, you can go visit it now. It was closed for about 10 to 12 years uh, for allegedly for renovation, although uh, it's kind of understood that the French who own the site uh, closed it because Orthodox Jews were attempting to turn it into a prayer site. And so there was a great deal of tension between the French owners and the Orthodox Jews uh, in that area. But they have reopened it. You just have to go online and sign up uh, and you can take a tour. You can't actually go inside of the tomb itself though. And that I was lucky enough to, to uh, be able to do a tour inside of there. And it's really spectacular. It just goes on and on and on. And like so much of Jerusalem, as you mentioned, it's hidden from view and you don't really know it's there. So uh, the place itself is, uh, it's still unclear as to who actually was buried there and who actually built this tomb, which is the largest tomb in Jerusalem. And uh, there's still a good deal of debate. I did a story in, um, in uh, Biblical Archaeology Review a couple of months ago that goes into some detail about what Dalzi, Dizalzi found and uh, what scholars since have discovered. But ask your question. So after the, this first Frenchman dug in the 1860s, the British were, were appalled to see this important, allegedly biblical artifact in the Louvre, uh, when the British Museum had nothing of that sort. It had lots of other things from Greece and Rome, ancient Greece and Rome, but nothing from Jerusalem. So immediately uh, a society was formed called the Palestine Exploration Fund, still exists. In fact, I'm going to give a talk there in London next week. And they sent uh, some of these really, some of the best map makers and cartographers in Britain to Jerusalem to try and understand what lay beneath the city. And Charles Warren is one of my favorite characters. He was digging beneath using dynamite, using uh, explosives in order to blast his way through uh, certain tunnels to open things up. Uh, again, not endearing himself to the locals, uh, uh, just as de Zolzi had angered uh, local Jews. So you get this tension between the local people and these foreigners coming in doing crazy things like blowing things up beneath their feet, close to a very important uh, historic and sacred sites. So by the, the turn of the century, the British really dominated. They were the ones who had the money and the expertise and the political pull to get the dig permits in Jerusalem. And they were able to, to more or less take over that business from the Germans and the Russians and the French who had also done digs in the latter half of the 19th century. One interesting aspect that comes out of the book, it's that uh, they all, I mean, the various archeologists involved in the various you know, periods of time under a, uh, under review here, I mean, even moving into the 23rd century, they always had tensions with the locals. But the locals also disappear from the narratives of historical writing often. They're just mentioned uh, in relation to confrontation. Uh, sometimes they're briefly mentioned as diggers because obviously they have, these archaeologists have to rely on local people in order to actually excavate the various sites. And I was wondering, how did you feel about the locals when you were writing the book and how did you try to actually embed them in the various stories that you were writing about in, in your work? Well, this is a book I would love to write, which is uh, those, those small communities around the Middle East, uh, villages often that where you have people who have specialized in archeological digs for the past 100 or 200 years. Places like Iraq uh, are famous for having these villages that you know, archeologists from the West come, as you say, they need labor. So they hire these local workers and it becomes a, a seasonal labor essentially for, for whole villages. And in the case of Jerusalem, this was Silwan, uh, which is a village just south of the old city, just a little to the Southeast. And you know, these people were quite amazing. I mean, they were, they were you know, tough village people who uh, were happy to dig and to be paid for their digging. And they developed incredible expertise because working underneath Jerusalem is, is not only politically controversial, it's physically dangerous. Why? Because what's underneath the city is not just hard limestone. It's actually the result of, of buildings being destroyed and built and quarried over the centuries. And so as a result, there, the, the ground underneath Jerusalem is made up of these small limestone chips. And when you dig 
those chips, which at first seem solid, can immediately turn to almost a kind of liquid. So you have to have a great deal of expertise in order to, to work in this dangerous environment. And that's even true today. The digs going on beneath the city of David uh, or in the Wadi Hilwa neighborhood uh, have suffered many cave-ins, uh, fortunately none fatal, uh, because of this strange nature of what's beneath Jerusalem. So having these locals who really understood this environment were critical to the early diggers. And in fact, the people of Silwan contributed to the excavations in Jerusalem uh, up until the 1980s when the politics uh, drove the two sides apart and they no longer are a part of those excavations. That said, I should mention that many of the digs I visited in the old city in Jerusalem, although led by Israeli Jewish archeologists, the labor is still performed largely by Palestinians uh, from the West Bank. So there's still a tradition there. And I think that we tend to forget about these people, but they often develop extremely fine-tuned knowledge as to, uh, how to how to uncover artifacts, how to understand the stratigraphy, how to spot a wall. I mean, these people really have put in the time and effort, although they never rose to higher positions because of uh, a lot of uh, you know, social limitations. It just reminded me of a recent documentary on, uh, I think it was available on Netflix, Saqqara, about this uh, huge excavation in Egypt, which for the first time actually took time to discuss and show the lives of people digging the sites. So not just the leading archeologists and the historians interpreting the artifacts and the material, but also to look at who are these people and how they experience and how they actually learn their crafts. And so if you ever write a book about uh, people digging in these villages and towns that become essentially specialized in sort of this kind of labor, I'll certainly be the first one to read it because it's, it's a fascinating story that got lost uh, in, in, in a sense, uh, in relation to the digging itself, which I guess for many of us is, you know, the most important thing is what we learn from the dig. Now, you mentioned earlier the uh, Palestine Exploration Fund, and I just want to rem uh, remind the listeners that we had an amazing episode recorded with uh, Felicity Cobbing, uh, that she's the di current director of the PEF. And uh, that reminded me that with Felicity, we talked about uh, a number of archaeologists working in Jerusalem, some of them fairly controversial. And so before moving to uh, the various digs and the questions I have about some of them, I was wondering if you had uh, a favorite uh, archaeologist uh, while you were writing the book that, you know, sort of uh, drew a lot of your attention or stories that made you think about uh, this particular individual. Oh, absolutely. Uh yeah, and this, this was somebody who was actually not a uh, part of the Palestine Exploration Fund. In fact, the Palestine Exploration Fund had to put out a notice saying that this guy has nothing to do with what we are doing. And this is a British aristocrat named uh, Montague Parker. And this guy is, this story is simply blew my mind. It's, I did a, a chapter on it, but you certainly could do a whole book and people have recently, there are a couple of books that are coming out or have just come out about him. So Montague Parker was a British aristocrat who had too much money and too much time on his hands. So turn of the last century, around 1910 or so, he put together this team made up of a Finnish scholar who had this idea that he had cracked the code of Ezekiel, which would reveal where the Ark of the Covenant was hidden. Of course, it was hidden in a tunnel beneath Jerusalem. Uh, and then he pulled in a Swiss psychic. He pulled in, uh, I'm not making this up, a steamboat captain from the Congo River who was a Scandinavian. Uh, you really can't make this, this expedition. It was the most bizarre expedition in uh, excavation history. I won't deign to call it archaeology because the one person he forgot to hire was actually an archaeologist. <laughs> but he raised lots of money and was able to go to Jerusalem. He bribed uh, the officials in Istanbul to get a dig permit and began to dig. And for the next two years, it was an enormous dig involving hundreds of workers and some very sophisticated technology. In fact, he even brought in the person who engineered the uh, subway system in London, the tube in order to be able to create enormous tunnels to find the ark. And why were they doing this? Now, this is not about religion. This is not about finding a sacred object. This was about finding something that could sell on the art market for billions. 
So it was a good bet for investors because surely the treasure was there, it could be found, and then uh, you could make a fortune. So in, in, after about two years, of course, they found nothing but some odd bits and pieces of pottery, but nothing very important or major. And time was running out. So Montague Parker made a decision which had global ramifications. He decided to bribe the head of the Haram al-Sharif, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, what Jews call the Temple Mount, to uh, be able to access this third holiest site in Islam at night so he could find the Ark, which he was sure was hidden under the Dome of the Rock, that famous golden dome building that sits on the, in the center of the Acropolis. And that night, uh, actually it was several nights he was digging, the last night he was caught by someone who was, uh, came to pray early, saw these foreigners whacking away at the most sacred rock and, uh, for Islam and for Judaism as well, and set off the alarm. Now, Parker was lucky he managed to escape with his life, but there were riots for days. The British actually feared that there would be uprisings in the British Empire because there were so many Muslims in the British Empire that day, which included India. And maybe most importantly, uh, other than the fact that the, the Ottoman government nearly collapsed as a result of the scandal, this act actually inspired Palestinians, uh, Palestinian Arabs, because they said to themselves, look, the Ottoman Empire clearly cannot protect our holy site, the Haram al-Sharif. We have to do it ourselves. So in a way, it was really the kernel, the beginning of a Palestinian Arab nationalism, which of course is, uh, you know, is very important today in understanding what's going on in Jerusalem. In talking about understanding what's going on in Jerusalem, I wanted to start digging a little bit into a some of the work of these archaeologists and obviously the, the legacy that their work uh, sort of left and uh, how it then it became politicized later on throughout the British mandate, but certainly after 1948 with the creation of the State of Israel, 1967, when the city was reunified as a result of the Six-Day War and obviously up to the 21st century. And one is what we may call, uh, well, which is obviously officially known as the Warren Shaft or, or Tunnel, which was discovered in 1867 by, again, uh, Charles Warren, which was part of the Palestine Exploration Fund. And maybe back then was just a discovery connected to biblical archaeology. But looking back at that discovery, now we can see that sort of opened the door to a different set of claims. And I, I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about Warren Shaft and its uh, importance in the sort of a, in the larger picture of excavations around Jerusalem. Sure, well, Warren Shaft, which was this, this very, very steep tunnel that uh, Warren discovered, and actually Warren climbed, which was amazing because if you see it today, it's, it's, a, formidable, uh, it's at a formidable angle. And uh, actually today, it's, it's now believed, uh, there was a recent paper that came out that, that argues that in fact, this tunnel uh, is not, wasn't dug by uh, Israelites or even by Canaanites, that in part it is actually a natural, uh, uh, a natural cave, which you get in limestone. But I think more important is to step back and to look at the story. So the story that was applied to was, oh, this is where the Israelites climbed up when they were conquering Jerusalem, circa 1000 BC. So immediately when something was found in Jerusalem, uh, a biblical uh, solution was applied to the problem. And what I, what I think was the most surprising find I made in my investigations was that it really was the European Christians arriving in the 19th century who set the stage for what is still going on today. And they came without a whole lot of interest in the local people, whether they were Jews or Muslims, they were interested in finding the biblical past. They wanted to be able to prove the Bible. They wanted to be able to, to show that in, in, a, in an era when when evolution and geology were calling into question all of these, you know, ideas about Christianity, they wanted to be able to show that science could prove the Bible correct. Now, that kind of biblical archaeology has gone by the wayside, although you'll still find a few people who practice it. But for the most part, by the, by the early 20th century, there was a little more of a scientific approach. But nevertheless, this, this connection between the Bible, uh, proving the Bible, 
whether it's for political or religious purposes, on the one hand, and then doing science are these, this, this great tension is always at the heart of Jerusalem's excavations. After the, the Warren shaft, another important uh, excavation, which led to uh, even 21st century uh, problems is certainly the tunnels that have been dug uh, below the Western Wall. So basically starting from uh, Wilson Arch, which is this uh, sort of uh, arch that gives access to this kind of like a more superficial tunnel uh, next to the Western Wall. So obviously close to the Aram al-Sharif. Um, and down from there, you can actually visit all of these tunnels that were dug in time and they get close, very close, in fact, to the very center of the Aram al-Sharif, obviously underground. And, and eventually through a sort of a, a path, uh, you reach what nowadays is the uh, Islamic quarter of Jerusalem. And uh, obviously this is one of the most controversial uh, digging in Jerusalem, one that can trigger uh, the eruption of violence at any time. And it's not only controversial between the various groups is also controversial within Judaism itself because it's a question of the vicinity and the sort of the location obviously is very close to the holy uh, of the holiest so this you know sacred uh, ground for the Jews and I was wondering if you can give us a sense about uh, this digging and how it came about and how it developed ever since it was discovered yeah, the Western Wall Tunnel is a, which if, if any of your listeners have been to Jerusalem, uh, no doubt they visited, is it really has an extraordinary history. Because as you mentioned, it really began as uh, an effort by Charles Warren to find out what was beneath the area at the foot of the Temple Mount of the, of the Haram al-Sharif. And, you know, this is very important for understanding the, the history of, of Jerusalem. And the, the Sultan, though, decided to close up his the tunnel because the locals were complaining that their houses and homes above were beginning to collapse. So the tunnel was sealed, and it was only in 19, exactly a century later, in 1967, that it was unsealed. And the purpose uh, of the excavations that happened after 67 were very different from what Charles Warren was doing. This was an effort that was led by Jewish rabbis. And their goal was to create a prayer space that was as close to the Western Wall as possible. And by making it underground, it would be something that Jews could come and go without having to worry about conflict with Muslims. Now, this was a secret effort, and I hadn't fully realized this, but that tunnel was dug as part of a secret effort to create a tunnel beneath the Muslim quarter to provide a prayer space for Jews. And it took uh, a good 20 years to complete. And along the way, there were some collapses. Uh, there are lots of problems. Um, there was lots of leakage from sewers above, you know, into the tunnels. It was real engineering uh, nightmare. And it was also an archeological disaster because the rabbis who were digging had very little interest in, in actually sorting out what was what. They were not interested in the science. So, untold amounts of material were lost in that being dug out over these 20 years. And finally, the Israeli government said enough is enough. And they said that because of the efforts by uh, this one rabbi who actually began in the 19, early 1980s to dig not along the base of the wall, that is, that is outside of the Haram al-Sharif, but he actually penetrated inside of it. And this nearly caused a regional war. Uh, as Rabbi Getz was his name, and he was after the Ark of the Covenant. So here we have again this desire to find these ancient artifacts, which is always on the brink of starting a war in Jerusalem. Now, the, his dig was discovered, it was closed up, uh, that was sealed, so no longer can anyone enter into uh, beneath the Haram al-Sharif. But still, to this day, you have people... Uh, uh, the Muslims, the Muslim walk that controls the Haram al-Sharif, they check the water levels every day because of the many cisterns. And if a cistern, the water level drops, that could be a sign that the cistern is being drained by Israelis trying to enter in to what's beneath the Temple Mount. So it's a very hot topic. And there's no place in the world that I know of where you could, you could open uh, a new exit to a tourist uh, attraction 
and immediately spark riots that kill 100 people and, and injure thousands, which is what happened in the 1990s when the far end, the north end of the Western Wall Tunnel was opened. Uh, you alluded to it earlier, and it created uh, enormous violence. And in some ways, it really began the end of the peace process that was begun in Oslo. And from that point on, there was so much blood was shed. There was so much bad blood between the two sides that coming up with a Palestinian state that could live in harmony with an Israeli state uh, seemed to go by the wayside. And certainly uh, in 2000, uh, that collapsed completely. And certainly not only the tunnels cause problems because obviously uh, ever since the end of the 20th century, the beginning of a new century, we also saw the uh, development of excavations uh, around uh, Silwan, which is uh, a neighborhood in East Jerusalem, and which is also historically uh, recognized as the most likely uh, location of Ir David, the city of David, as uh, you know, in ancient Jerusalem. But that's obviously only one superficial layer looking at the area, because obviously Ir David uh, means, again, political claims of ownership over that particular land. And you talk about extensively in the book about uh, the question of digging in Ir David. And I was wondering, what is your take? And also, if you can just summarize for us the story that you tell in the book. So one of the big questions in the 19th century was, where is the city of David? The city of David referring to the early Jerusalem, the Jerusalem of David and Solomon, the early kings. And the trouble was that after decades of digging, nobody knew where it actually was. Nobody had found the remains. So it became a, a, a major focus, even obsession among archeologists to find this important piece of Jerusalem's history that was missing. Now it was, it was in the 1980s and 90s that, that the digs resumed in that area after you know, uh, several centuries of, of them not being, uh, them being ignored. And, to the surprise of the archaeologists, they discovered, in fact, lots and lots of Canaanite remains, or earlier remains from, uh, from the centuries prior to the arrival of the Israelites, but they found almost nothing from those two centuries after the Israelites arrived. That is that period between of David and Solomon and the early kings. So this has really been a mystery and also kind of a political embarrassment uh, for the Israeli government, which, of course, was claiming uh, that this part of Jerusalem was not only part of Israel, but that it was really the heart, the, the, the center, the beginning of Jewish Jerusalem. So not having any evidence from this period was really problematic. And I don't mean just from the scientific point of view, but from the political and religious point of view as well. Now, as a result, there's been a lot of attention uh, lavished on this area, uh, primarily by an organization, the City of David Foundation, uh, which has been doing a lot of the funding for the digs. Uh, they hire very good, reputable archaeologists to do their digging, but some of the money comes from sources of, uh, uh, from the U.S. as well as from Israel, from people who really support their efforts to displace Palestinians and replace them with, uh, with Jewish settlers uh, to increase the Jewish population of this particular neighborhood, which is called Wadi Hilwa within the Silwan uh, town. So above ground, you've got high politics going on. Below ground, you've got science occurring, but it's always linked to what's going on above. So this is where it's very difficult to separate the science from the politics and the religion. You know, the, sci the scientists who are doing the work, and many of whom I know quite well, you know, are mostly excellent archeologists who could do well in any archeology span uh, dig into any part of the world, but, they are inevitably tied into the larger political issues. Number one being that most of the world believes that this part of Jerusalem is occupied and therefore should not be dug at all. By extension, uh, that reminds me also of the other uh, dig that you talk about in the book, which is the Givati parking lot uh, uh, excavation site or dig, uh, which again is adjacent to a uh, the city of David, and uh, and as you mentioned, I mean, obviously, there were claims that the, that was going to be the place where material supporting uh, claims of the Israelites uh, uh, sort of 
rule of the city in earlier periods would have been found, but eventually uh, uh, scholars found something very different. They found from uh, uh, coins uh, uh, related to the Byzantine emperor Heraclius. They also found, if I remember well, um, a sort of a Roman uh, uh, Camille of uh, Cupid, so the, the, the god of, uh, of love, right? And, and it obviously it's, it's very different from what they were expecting. And still, th this remains an active uh, site of excavation and one that is very controversial. And uh, I was just wondering again, if you can give us a sense of the Givati parking lot dig and how, how important is this in the bigger picture of the City of David excavation? Right, so the City of David National Park uh, is, lies in this, this uh, little kind of peninsula of land that comes south of the Temple Mount of the Haram al-Sharif as Muslims call it. And the one corner of it is a national park. Across the street is this, was a parking lot. That's why it's called the Gavati parking lot. And uh, that is an unusual spot because in Jerusalem, it is extremely hard to find land that hasn't been built on recently. And so here was this one piece of land that promised to reveal uh, a lot about Jerusalem's past because it was a fairly large area that if you dig down, you would be able to find the different layers. And again, extremely rare in Jerusalem to have a large open space that's available for archaeologists. So unlike uh, the tunnel that's currently being dug under the uh, City of David area, uh, which is has a lot of, um, let's just say that's a whole nother controversy, the Gavadi was kind of a traditional dig where they started from the top and they dug down. And sure enough, they have found uh, evidence of layers of virtually every piece of Jerusalem's history going back as far and probably farther than the 586 BC destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. So what's beautiful about Gavati is that it has shown all of these layers of Jerusalem's history very clearly from the medieval uh, uh, Arab layers down to the Byzantine layers, down to the, the Roman layers. There's a, there's a Roman uh, Villa, for example, that was discovered, the Romans re-engineered that whole area. And then beneath that, you've got remains from the Hellenistic period. And as you mentioned, there's so all kinds of interesting uh, images that have been found, which you wouldn't think to find in Jerusalem, uh, given the taboo on, uh, on human images. But clearly, we now can see Jerusalem as tied into the larger world in which it was it, it was placed. It wasn't just a city on the hill that was isolated with its own political and religious beliefs. It actually was tied into the trade routes that were going between the Mediterranean, the Dead Sea, uh, north of Syria, south of Saudi Arabia. You know, you have a, a real wealth of connection. So for the first time, Givadi is providing all kinds of you know, fascinating finds that show us a Jerusalem that is far more cosmopolitan and tied into other parts of the Middle East than we knew before. I love that, that part in the book where you talk about the fact that, in a sense, the material that has been found at the Givati dig allows us actually to look outward from Jerusalem, to get a sense that Jerusalem was part, as you just said, of a larger network, where often we tend to look at Jerusalem as isolated within the world of Judaism and the small region of, uh, of Palestine and, and sort of the Israelite kingdom when that, that existed uh, under uh, King David and Solomon. But actually Jerusalem was part of different networks in different parts of time. And, uh, and, and that I found very important to, to remember that obviously it would be impossible not to find material coming from other parts of the world in Jerusalem because Jerusalem was not an island and was not in isolation. And I think this is an important aspect that you highlight in the book. I want to ask you something about uh, uh, Zionism. You've wrote a, a very interesting article on uh, Aretz. I think it was in January of 2022. And there's a link on your website. How 19th century Western archeologists made Jerusalem a Zionist dream, which in a sense picks up from uh, what you just said at the very beginning of the interview, that it was the Europeans that brought this modern sense of uh, modern sort of a sense of archaeology and created problems beginning, you know, the uh, mid 19th century, digging here and there uh, for their own purposes, essentially just, uh, uh, you know, looking for biblical evidence. And I was wondering if you can give us a sense of how actually archaeology supported 
the Zionist dream and made Jerusalem part of his Zionist dream. Yeah, I was really astonished to, to make this connection and a little surprised that other, other people have not uh, made it any kind of depth in the past. And it, it's really easy once you look at what happened. You have Europeans arriving, European Christians arriving who want to uh, not only colonize and control Jerusalem and the Ottoman Empire, but also want to prove the Bible true. And this created a, a, you know, a whole series of generations of people who were looking for the biblical past and had very little interest in the current day uh, life of the city. And by the 1880s and 90s, European Jews, uh, who of course were reading the same newspaper articles and seeing the same museum exhibits as their Christian brethren, they began to ask the question, why are we allowing these European Christians to dig up what clearly is our heritage? And so this inspired uh, early Zionists to uh, consider Jerusalem as a place not just of superstition, which was how many had viewed it, you know, Herzl and others, Theodor Herzl, the founder of Zionism and others, you know, looked really askance at Jerusalem because it seemed like an old medieval place that was far removed from the kind of you know, socialist paradise that they were, they were imagining for a future Jewish state. So Jerusalem though had that magnetic pull uh, first on these, these European Christians who went and then on Jews who arrived and decided we need to be in charge of, of securing our own heritage. So I mentioned Montague Parker, the crazy British aristocrat who dug for the Ark of the Covenant. Well, what's not widely known is that shortly after uh, a Jewish expedition began work to allegedly find the tomb of David, but actually their goal as well was to find the Ark of the Covenant because uh, the idea of, of Christians capturing this, this important symbol of Judaism uh, was, just, uh, was just too terrible to even contemplate. So this inspired the first generation of Jewish archeologists in the Holy Land and of course, these are the people then, uh, the, the people that who are working there today are kind of descended from, from those early Zionists who saw this effort as uh, not just a, uh, a scientific endeavor, but also it had this nationalist feel to it, almost like you have, um, say, in America with colonial archaeology, which uh, traditionally, you know, you, you're interested in finding uh, what happened with the early uh, founding fathers, for example. So it's very similar in Israel and uh, how Zionism became uh, fascinated and imbued with these ideas of archaeology. I was fascinated by the fact that both in the article and in the book, you quoted uh, uh, former prime minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, with a very famous um, uh, quote uh, when he said, it has been proved without a doubt that Jerusalem is the main artery of our national consciousness. Uh, the root of Zionism is in Zion. And interestingly enough, when you look at actually the early Zionists, they all were very critical of Jerusalem as a sort of a memory of the diaspora, of destructions, and in fact, of the old uh, sort of Jewish life. One, you know, there was uh, certainly more religious, poor, and all of these people visiting Jerusalem back in the early 20th century, uh, wrote critical, uh, you know, material, sometimes uh, entries of their diaries, of letters, uh, even articles on newspaper criticizing Jerusalem. And now we had this massive transformation where Jerusalem has certainly become the, the, the most important element in, in Israel as a state for the Jewish people. And that made me think about uh, the next question. Do you think... Let me rephrase it. Is there room in Jerusalem for non-religious archaeology? And if so, how? <laughs> That's a great question. And I think the, the companion question would be, is there room in Jerusalem for non-political archaeology? And if so, how? And I think the answer is no, uh, not in the foreseeable future. And I say that with all respect to the archeologists in Israel who work extremely hard, long hours, tough work, uh, and they certainly are not overly paid uh, to do this work. So, so while I respect the science that is going on there, much of which is very first class, um, I don't think there's a way you can separate the politics and the religion from what's going on in Jerusalem. Just as an example, 
uh, it would be impossible for a Palestinian archaeologist to receive a dig permit from the Israeli Antiquities Authority. I say impossible, I suppose it's not impossible, but it certainly hasn't happened yet, and it's unlikely to happen, because Jerusalem is considered more than just a place for scientists to dig. It is, it is the most contested city in the world, and part of that uh, contest is controlling the past, is controlling the narrative of the past, and that is how we define the present in Jerusalem. It's through the past, and that makes the science in Jerusalem always allied in some way with the people who are in political control, whether they are uh, European Christians who have, uh, who have intimidated the Ottoman Empire, whether, it's, whether they're British uh, during the British mandate, uh, whether they're Jordanians during the Jordanian occupation of uh, before 1967, or whether they're Israeli archeologists today. So, the one thing I, I really want to get across here is that this is not something that began in 1967 or 1948. Really, the groundwork for Jerusalem's archaeology being so wrapped up in politics and religion goes back to those early days in the 1860s, long before there was Zionism and long before uh, people were talking about an Israeli state. Uh, this really goes back to the European Christians and their ideas about the Old Testament. And that is what laid the foundation for the, uh, the difficulty we have today in trying to do science that is uh, somehow uh, apart or separate from the politics and religion. Then I have to ask uh, the one million dollar question. Do you think it's very rule for archeology span in a future peace process, whatever it may be, whatever it may look like, or should archeology span be kept aside from political consideration? Archaeology cannot be set aside. In fact, it has to be a central part of any kind of peace that is agreed to. In fact, the, the collapse of the Oslo Agreement was in large part due to disagreements over archaeology about who, who could dig and where and when on the Temple Mount of the Haram al-Sharif. Um, this, this was a central sticking point. This is one of the great obstacles that prevented peace from breaking out in the Middle East. So I think we have to really focus on the archaeology, not just as a scientific endeavor, but as an expression of people's desire to, uh, to understand and own their own heritage. And Jerusalem is a place where many people from many faiths for many millennia have come together and created a very unique and, and beautiful and sacred city. But everybody's got a piece of that, and it's very hard for people to step out of their particular narrative. And archaeology is an important narrative, it's an important piece of the narrative uh, for Jews and Muslims and Christians. So I think we need to think about archaeology differently in Jerusalem than we do in most other places. While I, I really think that any archaeology that's done anywhere has a political and religious element, I mean, it always does in my experience. Jerusalem, it's just times 10. And once we recognize that, I think that the science can can do what the science does best, gather data and come to conclusions that aren't tied to political beliefs or religious beliefs. And at the same time, it can also give people a sense of their, their own heritage uh, and they can read the finds as they will. I wanted to ask this question because often people don't really understand the importance of archeology span in Jerusalem and I would say in Israel and Palestine at large, you know, if you think about uh, other countries, particularly the country I grew up uh, in, Italy, where we have plenty of archaeological sites and digging, but often the controversies are among scholars in sort of a interpretation of the past or dating objects and artifacts, so about the certain stories of either individuals or cities, but they never really reach that level of politicization that also may lead to political violence. And for many, this is hard to understand. And I was wondering, since you worked in archeology span for such a long time, you've wrote extensively about archeology span in the Middle East, how did you reconcile sort of this sort of dual uh, aspects? There is an archeology span which is contested mostly by scholars, but also there's an archeology span that has a, a direct impact over the life of people as of 2022. 
Well, this is what drew me to Jerusalem after all those years of trying to avoid the place, uh, because this, this combination of you know, trying to understand the past while doing it in, in a charged political and religious context in the present is actually a, a really fascinating human endeavor. Uh, and if you step back and look at it that way, then Jerusalem, it makes Jerusalem a very unique and special place in a way that is maybe different from the way we normally think of it as a unique and special. And that is, it is a place where, where the science can be used as a weapon of destruction or a weapon of divisiveness, or it can be a tool for understanding and a tool for, uh, for appreciating other cultures. Now, science is not going to show us how to do that. That is up to people's uh, faiths and people's political beliefs. And if we decide to take the data that's coming out of the ground in Jerusalem and look at it in new ways, yeah, you know, we can see that in some ways it will back certain narratives and other ways it will undermine certain narratives, whether they're political or religious. And so I think this is the real secret, the secret weapon of the science in Jerusalem and elsewhere, uh, archaeology that happens in other places as well, is it can, it can pull the rug out from underneath some of our conventional beliefs and show us a different way of seeing the world. And I think uh, most people might agree that that we all need a, a different way of thinking about Jerusalem if we want it to be a place that lives up to its uh, name as the city of peace. I have a couple more questions, but I'm really interested to hear from you. If you were to speculate about the future, what do you think would be a discovery that might actually change our understanding and possibly the future of Jerusalem? Well, frankly, I don't think that there's anything that could be found that would fundamentally change people's views. Because as I said, you know, people's views about Jerusalem are pretty set. They're, you know, you've got the Christian story, the Muslim story, and the Jewish story. And within those, of course, you have multiple stories. But you have these three major stories. And uh, so, for example, when Elat Mazar, a well-known Israeli archaeologist who passed away last year, discovered what she claimed was likely King David's palace, this was big news among many Jews and Christians who said, see, this proves that the Bible is true. This proves that Jerusalem was an important place, an important king lived there. Uh, but there were archaeologists who said, no, we don't think so. Uh, the data doesn't quite live up to that billing. And in fact, that's still an ongoing debate. So I don't think there's anything that could be discovered in Jerusalem, even if it's the Ark of the Covenant itself, that would fundamentally change the way we think. Now, that said, I do think that there are small finds that can be made. For example, the discovery that the step street leading up to the Temple Mount that is now being excavated in the form of a tunnel beneath the city of David, uh, that that was probably built under the patronage of Pontius Pilate. Now, that was a shock to many Jews as well as Christians who view him as somebody who was a destructive force, who didn't uh, respect Christianity, uh, certainly not Jesus, nor Judaism. So, I mean, that's a kind of example that I think allows us to see the Roman Empire in a, in a more nuanced way. And I think once we are able to take the data and look at things in a, this more nuanced way, we can let go of some of these you know, old fashioned conventional views and I think have a, a, a clearer picture of what actually happened in the past. Now, whether that changes people's political or religious views, I could not begin to say. What have the Romans ever done for us, right? That was Monty Python. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I was trying to remember the, the right quotes. Uh, In fact, I discovered that, uh, that the Israeli Antiquities Authority, uh, it's a requirement uh, when you become part of the authority that you actually watch the life of Brian, because in many ways, it, it, it contains a lot of wonderful accuracies. <laughs> I have one last question. Now, your book is thick of details and amazing stories, uh, and obviously history, as it portrays, I would say, the history of digging in Jerusalem since the mid-19th century. Is there anything that I didn't ask, but you think is very important to talk about here uh, on the podcast? Well, the one thing I could say, and, and I've, I, I've gotten some flack for this, but I, I do have a belief that maybe naive, maybe a little too American, that 
the science that is being dug up in Jerusalem and has been for the past 150 years does give us a chance to see this place in a new light, to see the Temple Mount or the Haram al-Sharif not as Jewish or as Muslim, but as a combination of many cultures that over millennia have worked and built and renovated and destroyed to create what is there today, that no, no people can claim Jerusalem as solely theirs. And I think the, the science does back this up. We have the evidence to show that that's true. So I think in some distant day, probably won't happen tomorrow, even in a century, but you have to think in the long term when you think of Jerusalem, I think it's possible that the archeology span could actually move from being a divisive uh, project and into one that that gives people a, a larger sense and a larger appreciation of what is a, a city with a fantastic history. Given the recent events uh, connected to COVID-19 and the disbelief in science by many, I wish I could share your uh, hope for the future. Maybe I'm not American, maybe I live in America, <laughs> so I started developing that, but it's certainly very uh, hopeful and at the same time, very hard uh, to see that happening uh, in the near future. I agree, but I think we do need to think in, in, in the long term. I mean, it took uh, the idea of evolution was something that it took a century or two centuries, it's still not accepted in many places. So I think we have to set aside our idea that this is gonna be resolved in 10 years, but rather think in, 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 in terms of an era <laughs> rather than a decade. But I'm convinced that this, information, it is there. And every day, more and more information comes out. So we are getting a fuller picture of the richness of the history of Jerusalem. We no longer have to focus on a single period. We can actually see these five millennia in a way that was not possible 100 years ago. And for that, we have to be grateful to the archaeologists who've done the hard work. This was Andrew Lola, author of Under Jerusalem, the Buried History of the World's Most Contested City, published by Doubleday, New York, available on all websites where you can buy your books uh, and certainly in your local bookstore if you can still find one open. Andrew, thank you so much. Thank you very much. I enjoyed talking. And if anybody uh, wants to contact me, you can go to www.andrewlawler.com and uh, just click on contact and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to support the podcast, please share it with others on social media or leave a rating and review. To catch all the latest, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Jerusalem Unplugged. Thanks and I'll see you next time.